Hi, this is Chiezan, the prior at Sokokoji Buddhist Monastery. If you value these talks and would like them to continue, please visit our donate page at www.sokokoji.org. Thank you. We're going to be continuing with uh, talks on the six paramitas. And uh, I can't say that I look forward to any of the talks, but this one in particular. Because if it's, uh, there's one thing I've never been called, it's patient. And so we're going to talk about uh, patience or kashanti tonight. And while we've talked about how these six paramitas can arise, quite, uh, they co-arise. They co-arise. You can't really have one without the others. But we can still talk about them sequentially. And I really liked Trungpa Rinpoche, just hearing him over and over again, hearing the way he talks about them, it helps me reflect on just some of the ways I work with my surrounding world. And I, I thought this was nice. So our first week we talked about generosity. And Trungpa Rinpoche talks about it as like a stripping away. We're stripping away some of the poverty mentality. We're stripping away some of the, the barriers or the boundaries or the fears. And then he talks about discipline. We're in the midst of this stripping away. We might experience some loneliness. And patience, if we were to follow this, is our willingness to be with that loneliness, to not correct the pain, to be without resentment. What's most difficult for me uh, in reading about patience is it acknowledges anger more than anything else. And the Buddha paid special attention to anger. If you read through the Nikayas, he talks about all three poisons, passion, aggression, and ignorance. There's sometimes five kleshas, passion, aggression, ignorance, pride, and jealousy. But the way anger is talked about and emphasized is pretty uh, intense. And because, again, we're talking about basic Buddhist teachings, I, I want to give you some of the classical background. So what I'm about to say is not something Sokazan teaches, or any one of us may ascribe uh, to, but classically it's said that one moment of anger can destroy eons of good karma. So one moment of anger, and Trungpa Rinpoche also emphasizes anger because he says even passion has some sense of including. There is some sort of energy, there's some sort of inclusion that occurs with passion where aggression is a type of isolation, it's a type of destruction. It can't be the case. And so in talking about the paramita of patience, for me the reflection is on anger. Because we can't always see how these paramitas manifest but we can certainly see the ways in which we fight with them. And we should also clarify that it is a paramita, it is a perfection. We're not just talking about being able to wait for the movie or wait for your ride or um, listen to somebody drone on that's a bit irritating. The way Sokazan's talked about this is patience is the waiting itself. It's not waiting for something. If you're waiting for something, it's conditional. It's like an accomplishment here. It has a type of aggression. I'm going to wait because I know I can outlast my anger until I get what I want. The Trump Thorne Pache says it's, it's not. You're not waiting for anything. In a sense, you have a complete willingness for samsara to be as it is. And we know that samsara is without end. Classically, again, it's talked about samsara. Suffering is without end. So if our patience is, is rooted on results, samsara is going to outlast us. But if our patience begins to orient itself towards a complete willingness for samsara to manifest as the glaciers, as confusion, as spinning, then we might start to catch a glimpse of what patience is pointing at. No agenda. No direction. I also like the Trumpa talks about it's not a sterile situation that the patience has to be energized with um, 
anything. I could say a desire for the Dharma. That this patience this isn't something we just cultivate conditionally, but there has to be some aspiration to see the truth. And that's something I think we all have to work with. It's not always so straightforward because as we've talked about, all these teachings conceptually, they really land. A lot of them we can, ah, yeah, the six paramitas, that sounds great. But it's all wrapped up in this idea of us accomplishing them and, and being a great bodhisattva, this image of who we will become. So Trungpa Rinpoche says we have to connect with, with an intention to see the truth for the benefit of others. I just bought a book for Sokuzan. I happened to buy a copy for myself by a teacher named Gangshar, Kempo Gangshar, who taught Trungpa Rinpoche. And uh, at the beginning of the book, it's talking about how if you're just picking up a Dharma book, even though we may not be able to see it, there is some inspiration there. It's not just about self-gratification. It's not just about scholasticism. But there is some sort of connection, some inkling of bodhicitta that wants to extend itself to others. So as with the other paramitas, there are three types of patience. The first two are considered aspects of relative truth relative practices, and the, the, the third one is more oriented towards realization or ultimate truth. So the first one is overcoming others' destructiveness. And this is when we endeavor to relate to others to um, not antagonize or inflame a situation through anger. So the patience is a willingness to be with the destructiveness or the aggression of the world or the insanity of the world without going to war, for, war with it. The second is realizing the nature of others' aggression. This is one that conceptually is pretty easy, but in practice it's difficult. But conceptually it's just saying people act aggressively because of their suffering. The, the negativity that we bring into the world, in a sense, is a result of our own suffering, our own fears, our own negativity. And so again, conceptually it's like, oh, I can understand that. I see how that functions, but it's very difficult when someone points that towards you to begin to actually see that. The last one is individually examining each situation. So the first one we're talking about kind of a broad sense of um, looking at the aggression of the world and then acknowledging that it comes from suffering, but that we have a responsibility to look at each one of those situationally to see the truth in each one of those, not just a, a broad teaching that we can apply to the world, but that we can investigate moment by moment. So we start with generosity, we look up, we recognize the suffering of the world, we begin to give our generosity direction through discipline, which is not a form of aggression, and we begin to practice patience because we have to be in the midst of samsara. We finally acknowledge the truth of suffering. Now we have to be with it. Are there any questions about the paramita of patience or any of the paramitas that we've covered in the last couple of weeks? Can you, can you please repeat the, the second form of patience? Yes. But uh, Trungpa calls it uh, realizing the nature of others' aggression. And again, this is all coming out of uh, Trungpa Rinpoche's second volume on the Mahayana, the Bodhisattva Path of Wisdom and Compassion. It's just uh, this series of books is an excellent reference for just about anything. I think somebody reached out online and asked about the 12 links. And uh, you can go right into the first one and Trungpa Rinpoche has a really clear way of elucidating those teachings. Honobai, when you were describing uh, the anger that arises, almost co-arises with patience, I guess maybe you wouldn't have used that word. But anyways, it, it, it um, made me think of pride uh, and identity, how much of our identity is wrapped up in, is it trying to be patient? 
trying to be with. Uh, I don't know. Is there anything there for you um, in that question? Sorry. <laughs> Do you be trying to refine that a little bit? Well, Devon, can you restate why you were bringing up anger in relationship to patients? Um, if we go through this progression of generosity to discipline and the loneliness, we start to begin to experience or see in that second paramita. There's a certain rawness to it because we have some insight into the nature of suffering, but not so much where we're not buying into it. So we recognize suffering, we see suffering, we see the nature of the first noble truth, but we still want to fight with it. We resent it for being the way that it is. So we begin to struggle with samsara. So the patience is our willingness to be with samsara as it arises. Look at how personal we take it. And I, I think that this is, like we talked about this a little bit last week when Trump learned, but they said it's best not to start, but once you start, it's best to finish. And that's how that shows up for me, is that we have a flash of relative insight that may actually shift the way we perceive the world. It may actually have that kind of strength where we begin to really recognize suffering and not just conceptually, but we've not penetrated it. We've not thoroughly penetrated that truth. And so I think a lot of aggression can arise because we're still wanting the ego to experience some sort of peace or some sort of resolution or equanimity. So the aggression is second nature. It's like this conditioned response to adversity. Aggression can take different forms. It can be aggression towards oneself. It's not just aggression towards the world. It can be aggression towards oneself. And this is something that, again, I think that is, is highly emphasized in the teaching because of how quickly, um, how easy it is to destroy. It's so easy to destroy something. It's so easy to destroy. Like, you can cut down a tree in a matter of minutes. That took 300 years to grow. And I think our anger, maybe it's not that dramatic because I think there is a way where we can recognize that and work with that, but so many of our relationships can end that way. It's like you take decades nurturing a relationship and then one thing happens and we just take a chainsaw to it and we never revisit it or justify. So patience really points out the anger, points out the aggression because we don't want to have to wait. We just want to be served. So and also what you're saying then is uh, patience is helping us see our self-reference. Anger is helping us see our self-reference. The patience, at least as I understand it as a paramita, is not something you're going to be able to, to distinguish and implement. This would be relative patience. This would be still, it can be valid. There are times where we, we practice that, and I can give examples of Sokas on his teachings on patience would be, you know, don't hook up your vocal cords. That, that forces, maybe not forces, but if you can practice that, there's a bit of a pause. Hold your seat. So the impulse is there, but you don't immediately connect it. But it's not really the implementation of patience, it's the awareness of the aggression, or it's the awareness of the impulse that points us in that direction. I think that's what's so difficult, because if it were a matter of implementing patience, we'd have an easier time at it because at least we'd have a little bit of credential to motivate us to keep going, whereas the way in which our negativity is exposed over time is a lot less satisfying than an increase in equanimity and patience and balance. Are you saying then we patiently wait for patience? Um, we, when we talked in book study, I, I'm hesitant to say no because, it, again, if that is a framework that you can resonate with, that it helps you relate to it, then I would say that that's, that's workable as long as it doesn't become too much of a, a benchmark. But to me, 
I have never particularly experienced anything in my life that I would call patience. I live with patience. My wife. I mean, you, you, honestly, there's nobody who has less of an agenda that I, I relate to on a daily basis. She just is not concerned. If Rumi takes two hours to eat lunch, I'm like, come on, eat, eat. You know, we gotta do something else. Hurry up, we gotta walk. Put your shoes on. And she's really interested about the Velcro straps. You can do five minutes of strap and Velcro on shoes. So I, I, I don't know. There are people that will experience perhaps patience, but for most of us, we may just have to look at the warfare with the tension that we create. I think, I don't know, it's not, it's not a universal thing, but those people that tend to be a little more assertive and like type A and agenda oriented, we struggle with patience. Like, I've got to watch on for a reason, you know. Stop wearing my watch. It hasn't helped. Can you have more? Can you? I think both of the relative forms of patients talked about other. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of why they're not um, pointing us back to ourselves? In a sense, well, they are. Because regardless of the external situation, we are still experiencing the defensiveness, the resistance here. And so that's where we begin to work with it. But I would say you could probably alternate that, looking at the source of our own aggression and our suffering, or endeavoring not to escalate our own aggression through condemning ourselves. So I think it would work in both directions. And I can't I can't give you a good reason why it's phrased this way or that way, but it does show up both ways. It's just the tendency initially is to see the problem externally. We think there's an antagonist. And we're, we always see ourselves as the protagonist. And so we begin to soften our attitude to the world by recognizing it's difficult. And it doesn't really help for us to inflame it for our righteousness. You? Even I. Can patience and desire work together in a way that um, benefits others? Yes, I think the path, the Bodhisattva path is. Yes. Can you repeat what you said? Can you repeat that again in here? Um, are patience and desire things that can work together for the benefit of others? And I feel that the, the path quality of the Bodhisattva path is entirely about a desire for the benefit of others. So I think that the path utilizes all three of the poisons. The path can utilize all three of those for the benefit of others. So if we can reflect on our, our sincere feelings of wanting others to be well, to be happy, the way we recite that on a daily basis, may all beings be happy and at their ease. It may soften our demand on the world, or it may just give us a chance to look more closely at the demand. Um, maybe like some time ago, Sokazan phrased the three poisons, like the enlightened quality of the three poisons was, uh, it was passion without grasping, anger without hatred, and ignorance without a self. And it's been helpful to reflect on to see that anything can be used in the service of others when it's not locked down on. That's not something we, again, can just implement, but it's something we can reflect on when we start to try to get rid of negative qualities. I think that's something that Vajrayana tries to point out a lot, is that actually using the raw material of the world for the benefit of others. Yeah. How about the desire for our own happiness and patience working together? Um, on some you know, beneficial or higher level than just getting what I want. You know? I think that that's, to me, it's always the starting point and usually the point we return to, particularly as we emphasize meditation so much, is that, of course, we know that meditation helps us 
look at the mind so maybe we're not causing so much trouble for others, but it's also about looking at our mind so that we're not so wound up in it. And so I think uh, wanting to not suffer so much, it's not such a bad thing, but to have it in the context of our overall intention of the vow, I don't think that has to look a particular way. It's not like you have to plug it in in the right way. But it's, again, if it's a helpful way to reflect on it, I wouldn't say there's anything wrong with that. Have you encountered either in the teachings or in your own experience a workable relationship between patience and control? Mm. It's been workable in as far as people tolerate it. And I would say that if it works at all, it's in a far smaller capacity than I would like. And so maybe there's a little bit of control, I don't know, with our insistence on practicing insistence on returning it might take a little bit of working through some resistance but i have not had a great deal of um, happiness come out of any aspect of control at this point that doesn't mean it's a necessarily a free-for-all but control sometimes locks down in a situation where the very thing that needs to happen is excluded because it's outside of the parameters of our ideas of how it should happen I think that I noticed that, especially parenting, I was parented in a very particular way that was completely about control and punishment and you know, this is how you do it. And noticing the impulse to you know, fall into that pattern because it's what I know, but also beginning to recognize how it doesn't actually help you need to grow to actually understand a situation that teaches them how to behave. There's no understanding to it, it's just conditioned behavior. Do you, and I'd be curious, do you have any examples, you know, something it sounds like you've looked at a little bit that control has been you know, somewhat workable? You know, I'm going to think about that. I just, um, it, it seems like for, as you've been talking, I've been thinking about powerlessness. And for me, one of the difficulties with patience is that it feels very powerless. And so I'm just wondering um, how they work together, what the connection is between less about having control, but more about like the anger associated with impatience being about not having control or being forced to sit with powerlessness in a situation. I wish I could recall where this was. And if you have a copy of this, it's a real short section, but Trump or Rinpoche does say something about this is not the word he uses, but off-gassing, like, like um, healthy expressions of that so that we can look at that. Um, and for me, sometimes it's just putting, I know some trigger points for me. Um, and again, it's very difficult because <laughs> the one is like this great bodhisattva I live with, right? And so I notice the impulse is to correct in the moment. <clears throat> Don't you see what you're doing? And to be able to, there's a little bit of control here. You could say, it's like, okay, that's it, that's it. And then this evening, I can sit down and we can talk about it and say, what was that like for you? This is how it looked. And then there's, it's more mutual. But it does take a little bit of like a fine touch. And I, I come back to Sokazan saying, don't hook up your vocal cords. Of course, there are times we can't do a lot about it. But even that instruction does sometimes cause a, enough of a pause. It creates enough of a gap where we have some sense of it not being skillful just because it feels good to say something. So again, it would be a little bit, and that is something that I know I have in the past and others have just working in tandem with Sokazan so that you're not just creating your own standard around it. That can also be a little bit dicey when you start creating your own standards around how to practice with intense emotions because it's always about compromise. And compromise is not realization. It's it's just trying to get through the day. Um, it's kind of folding back on itself now. Do you, as someone who 
has just said that you, you know, have issues or struggle, whatever, history with patience and anger. So as I've often says, like a willingness to not know. Do you see a connection between anger and powerlessness? Like there's like an unwillingness to not have power or an unwillingness to not have control. Like can patience kind of those three work in a weird way to shed light on each other? For me, I think there's a lot of fear. Like there's something very safe about anger because it's it's always correct. It's again, it's very it always feels very righteous. And so when we talk about patience or not knowing that it is very threatening because we want to protect ourselves from the world. We want to protect and maintain an identity, a sense of who we are. And so, yeah, those can become very threatening so that anger can actually increase our resistance, our resistance. I, am I not doing enough already? Don't I have a right to let this out? And I don't know that there's any way that that can be um, prescribed. I come back over and over to this this exchange between Kui Shan and Yang Shan, where um, Kui Shan said, "I don't tell you how to act; I just tell you to see clearly." So what's hard is we see how destructive the anger is, and we want to do better, but the doing better oftentimes is at the cost of seeing the anger itself. And so, unfortunately, we are probably going to continue to cause some suffering. But if we do, it's best that we see it more clearly instead of uh, immediately catapulting to the shame quality of it. We're talking about that cycle of aggression, outbursts, or anger, and then we feel sorry, and we apologize, and oh, I'll make it up, I won't do it again. Things are going okay, so we don't really have to look at anything anymore, and then before we know it, the anger bubbles up again. We're yelling. Um, it's hard not to catapult between those. It's hard to just have the anger, have the outbursts, and just feel that. The guilt and the shame can be pretty intense. Thank you for those questions. Other questions? You. The unbowing. Is there. Is there something that is too much patience when you go way into that end? Well, I would say certainly because at least the way I'm understanding your question is, is relative patience. If there's too much pace, patience, it's still this, this activity of maintenance. And so, yeah, you could, you could go in any <laughs> direction with it. Not enough, too much, but the most important thing again for me is, is looking at when we hear about a concept like patience and we begin to investigate it, it's like what is the sensitive point for me around that? What is the tender point? What is the resistance to that? And that's what I can look at because that has much more apparent quality that I can look at as a negativity as opposed to the activity of patience. So we do a little bit of it. We endeavor to hold our seat. We endeavor to receive. We endeavor to not hook it up. But the only reason we do that is to create some contrast to see the energy that does want to be expressed, does want to outflow. Mm -hmm. Being knowing is so I'm thinking of patience as a form to relate to that came to mind as you were speaking as is our relationship to patients more important than the patients itself? The way I am relating to it is almost entirely conceptual. And so again, I can only speak for myself that the reason that examining this idea of patience is so important is because it provides the contrast to see the, the opposite, or what appears to be the opposite. Continue to look at the impulse, to look at the aggression, the unwillingness, the unwillingness to be with samsara as it unfolds moment by moment. To prescribe any activity of patience is not something that I could do. But everything, everything to me, it just returns us to awareness. What inspires us to look more closely? For some people, you will never resonate with the paramita of patience. 
it just won't show. Maybe you'll never resonate with any of the paramitas that you really like the five skandhas, or you really like this teacher or that teacher. And I think that's that's pretty important. And it's not just like, oh, we have to all get get behind this idea. So you could look at it uniquely and, and say, you know, if I do study this, I think you've got a copy of this book. You go through and you read it and you see what stands out. How does that show up? Questions this evening. Milka, Milka bowing. Are there stories that arise in our mind stream that are patient? Uh, what, uh, what do you mean? Can you say more? If we are wanting something else, is there any story that can come up that is patience? I can't say no, but the patience is not is not a story, it's it's not a thought, it's not a contradiction to impatience. It's it's more just like a, a willingness in the midst of things. Meditation is a practice of patience when we begin to see that the, the thoughts don't need to be modified. It doesn't mean the thoughts aren't disturbing anymore, but we recognize what the practice of meditation is, which is it's just sitting there. And whatever is, is arising has a, has a right to be there. It's, it's, it's sovereign. Those thoughts are sovereign. They're not yours to interfere with. But they feel personal, so we don't want that to be the case. But it's not a story that balances out you know, impatience with patience. And again, that's, that's just my understanding of it. Um, if we just get into this idea of patience being an activity, really, it would, no, it would be no different than a different path, like uh, working with somebody to help us be more patient. So the paramita quality is it's twofold. It's, it's not something that can be defined and it's for the benefit of others. It's not something that you can enact to contradict something. It's just beginning to see how appropriate everything is in the precise form it's arising in, that it's so sovereign that you have no right to go in and, and meddle with it. No, come on. Is there anything that can show us whether something is it appropriate or interfering in mm -hmm. that manner? Probably not. There's probably not going to, again, we're not going to fall into a prescribed activity. The idea of not knowing, I, I keep coming back to these Zen masters when Tung Shan was told not knowing is most intimate. But when we actually begin to, and Yin Long touched on this, this idea of helplessness, which is very threatening, it feels very threatening. That's not to say if you feel threatened you're being patient, but if you, if you don't know what's happening, there's a lot more potential for anything to happen as opposed to if we're trying to get a hold of what is happening. It starts to limit certain things and favor other things, and it's just uh, it's just another form of discrimination. So, mm -hmm. so I'm, is there something about anger that is inherently painful or agitating? Um, um, I would say no. That anger isn't really inherently anything. That Anger is, uh, I think, in its rawest form, it's just its energy. It becomes personalized. It becomes validated. And when we do that, it becomes expressed in such a way to maintain some positionality. But I don't think that anger has any inherent, oh, we shouldn't have anger, or it's an obstacle, or it's an in, in interference. But the way in which we relate to it, the way in which it, it kind of sneaks around and gets a hold of us or we get a hold of it, that's the area that we need to look at. Coming back to the idea of the 12 links, that, that link from desire to grasping, the desire level anger is, is there. It's just, it's just there. But it's at the level of grasping that we start to outflow, whether it's outflowing onto the world or outflowing onto ourselves. That seems to be the area where 
things start to get much more murky. So for knowing how are we to navigate something that is inherently not arising as agitation on the cushion? When you say navigate, could you say what you mean by navigate? So grand bowing, what is, you said this is a conceptual, you're coming in from a, in a conceptual way? Yes. Coming, working with anger on the cushion, how do we make that not conceptual? Yeah, Brown. Okay. Again, for me, it's seeing that you don't have to work with the anger. It's not arising so that you can do something with it in meditation, that you sit down and anger arises. The impulse to work with it is, is just as impulsive as the anger itself. So then we start to struggle with it. And I don't feel that there can be any sense of ease in meditation so long as we take it as an activity to get a hold of our thoughts and emotions and stories. Is there more in that way? Shoro? Shoro Bowing, um, earlier you had brought up, and my question is around, um, what is, what is that importance of having the intention to see the truth in the practice? I think it would probably vary from person to person with that aspiration to see this through to the end because there are ways to practice in such a way where you can create some relative ease for yourself. And that's something that you probably could potentially maintain for a while. And that's sometimes called a, a Pachek Buddha. And that's not to say that there's not a deep realization that is occurring, but you could say that it's incomplete. And so long as the rest of the world is suffering, we can only insulate ourselves from that suffering for so long. And I, I don't know, there's something also that's perhaps a little bit non-conceptual about that, that any one of us we can't really justify why we would commit to a path that says, I, I vow to liberate all beings in all times, in all directions, in all realms. And I, I vow to continue to do that tirelessly until that is seen through. If beings are limitless. I vow to liberate them all. So there is something that is a little bit not conceptual. You can't really justify why you would do that because it, for most of us, be enough to say, well, I, I vow to tolerate my life until it comes to an end. Find a way to do that in an easy way. And that's probably what a lot of people do. Shoto <clears throat> Bowing. So it, it sounds like, are you saying it's not necessarily important to have like a strong conceptual like goal with looking for the truth or trying to see the truth? Um, I don't know it was going to depend on the person, but I would say conceptually the, the vow to liberate all beings is pretty powerful. It's pretty strong intention. It brings me back to the path. Um, it's something I'm reflecting on in reading this book that I shared with Sokozan, this, this uh, monk. He uh, had some sort of premonition that the Chinese were going to invade Tibet in the mid 50s or had some insight that things were going to get pretty bad. And so he very quickly started proliferating these teachings indiscriminately. And to look at in the midst of all that, the priority was still the Dharma. Um, it makes some of what I relate to on a daily basis seem kind of petty. So I, I just think conceptually there's something pretty profound, especially when you have examples of people that have devoted their lives to other at their own expense, you could say. Jishin. Jishin Bowling. How does the um what was how does the realizing the nature of the other's aggression um what does it, maybe I will ask it a different way. What does it mean to realize the nature of others' aggression? Bang. 
the initial point would be to see that it's not personal, that the aggression arises out of one's own suffering and is projected onto others. So we personalize it because sometimes it's very explicitly made about us in a relative sense. But uh, conceptually, to just think about the amount of suffering someone has to be in before they start putting that out onto others. I think it's endeavoring to give us a little bit of um, <laughs> patience. <laughs> patience with the world or some consideration for the negativity or to acknowledge that that is not separate from the value taken. Thank you. Is the nature of others aggression different than my own, the na than the nature of my own aggression? Going? As far as I understand it, no, it's not. Super. The grand body. If if anger weren't painful or agitating, then why are we trying to target other people? I don't understand how that works. Going. Are you saying that anger isn't painful or agitating? It appears to be agitating. Yes. <laughs> to me too. So what's your question? Well, the first question I asked Sokar and Bowing was, is, is anger innately, maybe I used that wrong word, mm -hmm. is anger agitating or painful on some level? Innately agitating. Okay, relatively. Yes. I don't know why that... <laughs> It's so obvious, but I don't know where to go with that. But anger, as long as we believe this is solid, we personalize it. So we take that agitation, we create a story around it, and therefore we act out of that anger. Um, if I think of the example, so it's on use of clouds in the sky. If we begin to recognize that we are the sky, the clouds don't particularly mark the sky. It doesn't mean that there's not flashes of lightning and rumbles of thunder, but it's not affecting any thingness. But it's when we personalize ourselves that that becomes so agitating that we have to find a way to explain it and then act out of it. So I think it comes back to the misunderstanding of thinking that that anger is personal or has something to do with us or that we need to do something to resolve it. So Grand Bowing, if anger were not personalized, then it wouldn't hurt? I don't know that it wouldn't hurt. I don't think that we can say, oh, we, we get rid of something. But when seen clearly, it seems much less likely that we would use that as, as a weapon. Okay. We just have to feel a hurt. I don't think that it's just like, oh, it's completely um, pacified and there's no negative sensations whatsoever. But looking at how we use that as you know, ways to express So Grandbowing, what is happening when we aren't using it as a weapon? I, I don't understand what the switch is there, how personal, not personalizing it. It just sounds so easy. So. Can you ask that again? <clears throat> what is happening, uh, so Grandbowing? What is happening when we stop using, what is happening when we're not personalizing anger and we stop using it as a weapon? What is happening there? Bowing. I'm not sure. I think that that's when we have an opportunity to use it for the benefit of others. Uh, it, it, may, it may find an expression or it may not. But that expression or lack of expression is not something that we are strategizing for ourselves. Hi, my name is Shoka. I am a monk at Sokokoji, where I am committed to training my mind under the guidance of my teacher, Sokozan. We rely on your support for our programming, including a scholarship fund to cover living and tuition costs for those who are practicing full-time at the monastery. Thank you for your generosity.